Hi, this is Ryan from History Happened Everywhere. We just wanted to let you know that a small section of the show today does describe some methods of medieval torture, which aren't very pleasant. So if that's something you'd rather avoid, now you know. Otherwise, enjoy the show. History Happened Everywhere. A random place, a random time, and a topic pulled from the hat. The challenge? Find the fascinating, uncover the unexpected, and share the stories. You're listening to... History Happened Everywhere. My name is Peter Goddard. I'm here in the HHE studio with the ring to my Frodo. It's Mr. Ryan Weir. <laughs> I wonder where that was going. Uh, for a it was second. a scary start, wasn't it? But it went somewhere safe. <laughs> <laughs> How have you been, my friend? I am incredibly well. Oh, nice. Well, the Durs later last week gave us Animal. The time period was 1764 to 1848, and the island of Dominica. Or Dominica. Or Dominica. <laughs> I'm learning already. <laughs> That's right. Today, we're going to be escaping onto a Caribbean island. We're going to be looking through the dense foliage to uncover the natural world of escaped slaves. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're going to meet the brave warriors known as Maroons and see how animals help them evade being captured by Europe's mightiest armies. Ooh. So should we get started? I think we should. All right, let's do it. Off we go. So, rainforests and sulphur springs, black sand beaches. This is a bubbling, boiling hotbed of nature and history. There's animals aplenty, and some are dang tasty. Welcome to the nature island. Welcome to Dominica. Officially, the Commonwealth of Dominica, not Dominica. I'm going to struggle with that. <laughs> yeah, it's also not the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is about 600 miles away from it. It is an island in the Caribbean. It's halfway between North and South America. It's one of the youngest islands in the Caribbean. It's only 26 million years old. Oh, the whippersnapper, right? A little baby. It lies in the Windward Islands, which is between the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic. It's halfway between Puerto Rico and Trinidad and Tobago. Guadeloupe to the north and Martinique to the south. It's 29 miles long. It's a tiddler. Right, 29 miles long. It's 16 miles wide. 750 square kilometres, that's 290 square miles, which is 734 Dominicas to a France. Wow. I feel like by the end of this, we can know each of the animals by name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a mountainous island, originating from an ancient volcano, and it is one of the, the highest islands in the Caribbean. It is rich in natural beauty. There are towering peaks, there are deep valleys, there are 365 rivers, one for every day of the year. Nice. Yeah. It's 65 metre high waterfalls and natural hot springs, including the volcanically heated, steam-covered lake known as Boiling Lake. Boiling Lake, wow. That uh, doesn't sound as inviting as I imagine it is. I wouldn't take a swimmer. No, <laughs> it is the second largest in the world. 60% of the island is covered in rainforest. Lush. It's one of the most rain-heavy places on the planet. Rain falls heavily somewhere on the island at least once a day. Take a brolly is my top tip for Dominica tourists. Well, you say that, but the locals say that rain falls in such large droplets that if you get caught in rain there, you'll be soaked to the skin before you can even open an umbrella. So take an umbrella, but it's okay, going to be pretty so useless. so just have it up at all times <laughs> yeah. is what I'm getting. Yeah, there's a parasol. <laughs> parasol stroke umbrella. Wet season is August to January, so you might want to avoid that That's part. quite a lot of time, isn't it? That's <laughs> just half the year, really, by any measure. And it's heavy, continual rain for two weeks. Wow. Main exports, bananas, citrus, mangoes, soap, coconut oil, furniture, cement blocks, and shoes. I was with you uh, thinking, yeah, that sounds about right. And then you hit cement blocks and shoes, which felt like a left turn on that list. Right? Isn't that a bit weird? That's why I included it on the list. <laughs> yeah, the flag was adopted 3rd of November 1978, and it is designed by playwright Alwyn Bully. It's the only national flag in the world to feature a parrot. Awesome. Yeah, and it's one of only two national flags that uses the colour purple. Oh, really? Yeah, the only other flag other than Dominica is Nicaragua. Ah. But purple dye is actually made from the mucus of sea snails. Ah, I do love a, a rub my flag on 
<laughs> with mucus for that deep, rich purple colour. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, the national anthem. Okay. I'm Prepare. excited. I think this could be a real upbeat number. I'm, I'm... Or steel drums. Is that a possibility? Well, I've not listened to it yet. I've decided <laughs> that I'm not going to listen. I'm going to listen to them for the first time with you. Okay. And then we both get like a it's natural like a reaction. reaction. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so it's the Isle of Beauty, Isle of Splendour, and here we go. Sound weirdly familiar. Nice. Like those little trills. Da -da -da. It is upbeat. You were right about that. Oh. I said I spoke too soon. <laughs> oh, it's crescendoing. This is amazing. I can hear a recorder in the background, I think. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. nice. Uh, bring it home. That's great. Yeah! Oh, yeah. Round of applause on that one. That was great. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> that's me whistling. <laughs> Dominica Vax! Okay. Of course. <laughs> Much of the Pirates of Caribbean 2 and 3 were filmed there. Ooh. That was a short fact. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, British boxer Frank Bruno. Ah, yes. British newsreader Moira Stewart. Ah. They have Dominican heritage. Their parents were both from Dominica. I'm a big fan of both. You know what I mean, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes him sound like something out of Star Wars. <laughs> That's all I've got, I'm afraid. Good old Frank. That was Look Moira Stewart. <laughs> 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 I want to tell you about the rock at Pagua. Oh, I'm fascinated. I do love a rock. So there is a 60-foot rock at Pagua, which, according to folklore, is home to a small white flower which blooms only one day a year. Wow. Anyone who finds the flower can rub it in the palm of their hand, point their hand towards anyone call their name, and then mind control that person. That sounds amazing, and I want to read about it in a comic book immediately. <laughs> the story is, of course, legend. Or is it? Is it? <laughs> but there is, in reality, a white flower that blooms infrequently near the rock, and the plant, while it's in bloom, has a strong hallucinogenic and psychedelic effect. Nice. And when not in bloom, it doesn't have the same effect. So, you oh. know, you can see where this legend maybe yeah, came for from, sure. right? sure. That sounds amazing. Mind control. Oh, and a, oh, so many stories come to mind. Mm. In 2017, a Category 5, one of the largest hurricanes, uh, Maria, hits Dominica, and it results in 95% of buildings on the island being damaged or destroyed. Wow. That's almost all of them. Yeah, more than 50,000 people left the island and never came back. Wow. So there are fewer people living there now than there were before the, the hurricane hit. Still, Dominica has the highest number of centenarians per capita in the world. 27. Wow. They think it's something to do with the island way of life. Sounds great. Good um, food, nice chill, lots of water. Occasional <laughs> catastrophic hurricane <laughs> to spice things up. Yeah, that's right. Hey, Pete. Hey, Ryan. Peter Goddard, give me all your money. Why would I do that? Peter Goddard, give me all your money. Ryan, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying the mind control flower. What, so you've been to Dominica and found the white flower? Mm, no, I, I used something else. You found a different white flower? Yeah. Well, what flower did you use? Self-raising. Peter Goddard, call me an idiot. You're an idiot. Nailed it. Do you want to know some history? Mm hmm. In the 400s, a South American tribe known as the Arawak. Ah, uh, the Arawak. So they're living in Venezuela in South America. They get in boats on the Orinoco River and they follow the South Equatorial Current, and they settle on various islands within the Caribbean, including the island which will soon become known as Dominica. 1300s to 1400s, the Kalinago, also known as the Caribs, also arrive from South American mainland, and they start to settle there as well. They call the island Waitu Kabuli, which means her body is tall, a reference to the fact that the island has the largest mountain range in the Caribbean. Okay, then we get into the fun part. Is it slavey? <laughs> it's getting there. Sunday, 3rd of November, 1493. Who sails around the corner? Captain Cook? 
No. no. Co- um, the other one, Columbus. Yes, Christopher Columbus. Oh, he's got some bad form when he arrives in a place, <laughs> doesn't he? Yes, well, look, this is his second voyage, and he sails pretty much straight past the island. Oh, they must have been like, tense, <laughs> shh, don't tell him, shh, everyone, shh. Yeah, especially being the tallest <laughs> island there. Pretty unmistakable. But the island is pretty rugged almost all the way around the coast. It's very hard to actually ah. get out onto the land. You have to sort of clamber up over rocks and stuff to, to do it. It's and I not easy to get onto. The Arawaks probably came in in quite shallow canoes versus big deep hulled ships. Yeah, and we're probably wearing less heavy clothes and armour to be able to <laughs> clamber up the cliff. So, so Columbus, he sailed past but he did name the island Dominica after Sunday in Latin so with there being no gold there and resistance from the the inhabitants the Spanish don't settle on the island and they just sort of pass by and it's not until 1632 when the French claim Dominica but they also don't settle as well in 1642 to around 1650 Raymond Breton a French missionary he regularly starts to visit the island and at this point you know the, the introduction to the Europeans really starts to begin in uh, 1660, so just a decade later after Raymond Breton was there, the French and the English both agree that Dominica should not be settled. They don't fight over it. They just go, you know, let's just leave it to the Caribs as neutral territory and go about our business elsewhere. Now, these guys are kind of getting away with it, aren't they? They're like, shh, everyone keep still. They don't <laughs> seem to be coming yet. <laughs> and indeed, uh, for about 40 years, it remains neutral territory until the early 1700s when the English and the French start looking at all that lush rain forest and thinking you know what that would make really good timber ah they've had resources that's the fatal error for any pre-colonized nation isn't it (laughs) just having things that we might want is always going to end in disaster just be a rock (laughs) non-precious rock (laughs) that's that's the trick yeah so the english and the french they both start clambering onto the island and starting to cut in cutting trees down but they're not settling as they agreed 1715, there is a peasant uprising in Martinique, one of the islands nearby. And this sees rich French landowners flee, right? Because they're otherwise they're going to get killed. And they flee to Dominica, nearby island. And they create the first permanent settlement there. Oh, were they sitting there building a house going, we're not settling. I know what it looks like, but we're not. This, this is <laughs> temporary. Just a holiday, hut, really, if anything. <laughs> exactly. But they were. <laughs> And so, 1727, Monsieur Le Grand. Mr. Big. (laughs) Mr. The Big. (laughs) The first French commander, he takes charge and he establishes a government on Dominica and it makes it officially a colony of France. So that agreement they had lasted about 67 years. Well, it's something, I suppose. So, 1761, the British, they are looking at this, it's been about 40 years now, and they're like, hey, you know what we should do? (laughs) We should have that for ourselves. So that's what they do. Lord Rollo. Lord Rollo. Rollo, yeah. I'm Lord Rollo. (laughs) I say, you know what we should do. (laughs) Do you know, I've had an idea. <laughs> <laughs> so Lord Rollo, he leads a successful expedition into Dominica and the island is conquered pretty much within like an hour of them arriving. French were not expecting it and uh, it was a bit of a landslide victory for Rollo. Oh, uh, well, well done, Rollo. I'm sure <laughs> you're probably an awful person. <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause and claps on backs, boys. <laughs> 1763, Dominica becomes a British colony and it is the last island in the Caribbean to be colonised. Wow, but they snapped it up in the end. It was inevitable, I suppose. It was going to happen at some point, yeah. 1778, so we're talking about 14 years later, the French come back and they invade with help from some of their French-speaking population on the island. Ah. The island in 1783 is returned to Britain. 1795 and 1805, the French attempt to try and take it uh, and they fail to capture the island. It must be. If you think of this from the point of view of the indigenous people who'd been living there for centuries, Mm -hmm. it must be sitting there going, what is going on? Who are these people who keep showing up, having a fight with each other? Then it settles down for a bit. They must sat there with this thing, these people are mad. I think almost certainly they (laughs) thought they were mad, yeah. By 1805, the British are now importing slaves and producing and shipping sugar and coffee to Europe. The biggest slave population on the island had about 71 males, 68 female slaves. And in January 1814, 20 of those slaves run away, are recaptured and punished with 100 lashes to the males and 50 to the females. Yeah. So in 1831, the Brown Privilege Bill kicks in um, and that gives political and social rights to all of the free non-whites. 
seriously, you're telling me that there was a thing before white privilege <laughs> called was the literal brown bill. bill called the Brown Privilege Bill. That's exactly what they called it. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I can't imagine it was a hugely privileged situation, though. So what did this bill do? So it allowed for a new set of political and social rights for free non-whites. So right. not for slaves, but for those that were free, you could start to vote and you could have your own legislature and all that sort of stuff. I mean, if there was ever a definition of white privilege, it's passing a bill that gives brown people those basic rights <laughs> and calling that privilege it is <laughs> most definitely a privilege and you'll be delighted to learn <laughs> you can now vote yeah and only a year later three of the free black men were elected to a legislative assembly which led towards 1834 when the abolition of slavery kicks in four years later 1st of August 1838 full emancipation is granted and Dominica becomes the only British Caribbean colony to have a black controlled legislature Wow. Yeah, which is pretty cool. This, however, attracts French slaves from Guadeloupe and Martinique who are like, actually, this sounds much better than where we are. <laughs> and so they start running over and they start hiding on Dominica as well. 3rd of November, 1978. 1978? Yes, we jumped a little You'd bit. leapt there. We leapt a little bit. <laughs> I was on the ball. You were trying to sneak that past me, but I spotted it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, 1978, 3rd of November, the Commonwealth of Dominica is granted independence and it becomes a republic. Pretty recent. Pretty recent, yeah. Okay, so, animal in Dominica. What was there? Well, let me tell you about the elephant seashell. <laughs> So in the 16th century, a little bit before our time, the Spanish and the Portuguese have a bit of a problem. Those pesky African slaves, oh. <laughs> yeah, they keep on escaping. I mean... And disappearing off into the surrounding mountains and forests. Can't imagine why they would do that. Why would they do that? <laughs> so the Spanish refer to these runaways as cimarron. It's a word which means the beast who cannot be tamed. Like the stallion in the cartoon. Oh, cimarron, the, the horse. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Like the horse in the cartoon. <laughs> uh, basically, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese were seeing slaves as something more primitive than human, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a mindset being given away here, isn't there? <laughs> something animal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, one quote from a book written by a slave owner in that time period suggested that slaves, if treated with excessive severity, will run away. <laughs> <laughs> into the mountains and forests where they live like so many beasts but free beasts <laughs> notably <laughs> <laughs> yeah he doesn't he doesn't talk about that bit eventually cimarron and the cimarron problem in quotes become so common among the european colonizers that the english and the french shorten the word to maroon or marron uh -huh. uh, which more directly describes a runaway black slave gotcha. and i can only imagine these people were baffled by the concept of why anyone might want to run away <laughs> from their enslaved status and live as a free man almost all of them yeah well they were just I can't puzzle it out. They I can't would... figure out what we're doing wrong here. <laughs> That's right. They were treated as chattel, as, as cattle. cattle. You know, when cattle run away, they bring them back. And that was that was how they treated them. It's worth noting that this is just the colonizers that called them maroons. They didn't refer to themselves as maroons uh, or marons. The African slaves referred to themselves as Nyankipong Pikibu, which means children of the almighty. That sounds a bit more self-respecting. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. When the British took over the island in 1763, there were already more than 300 of these Maroons, including women and children living in sort of small settlements across the entire interior, organised into these sort of units headed by like chiefs, sub-chiefs, and like captains. So they sort of looked after those groups. But they're constantly sort of up and moving around because they don't want to be found. And this is a not a big place, right? There are presumably a limited number of places to hide. And yes, but remember that it's also vertical. So yeah. you've got a lot more space. It's not like a flat piece and of ground. foresty as well, so you're not like out in the open, I suppose. Very much so, yeah. You've got caves and cliffs and forests and all sorts of places that you can sort of hide out in. Very difficult to uh, to get to. Yeah, so against the sort of the backdrop of the French Revolution which is our time period, the British wanted to reduce the number of sort of potential agitators that were out there. They didn't want another revolution on their hands. Um, so they decided they were going to settle this by pretty much any means possible. The British and the US governments, they passed dozens of acts against the Maroons and they spent millions of pounds, millions of dollars trying to recapture these which is incredible when you think it's just 300 people on an island. There is a, a much cheaper alternative whereby you go, we're just going to leave you guys, enjoy your lives, see ya. <laughs> but why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do that? 
you know, from their perspective, they could have risen up and taken down the entire armed force of, <laughs> of Britain and France. I guess that was their argument. Anyway, so during the period of 1763 uh, to 1778, numerous uh, Maroons are captured and they're brought to jail where conditions there uh, were so appalling that many died on first arrival. Now, that could be due to torture. It could be to do with just the actual conditions themselves. But most of them didn't even see trial. Because that's another thing that I find will always calm and relax a population is imprisoning them and essentially borderline murdering them. That's really going to calm things down. <laughs> it does. And, um, you know, I wish I could say it could get better from there, but it does not. What it does do, though, is it creates a state of constant danger for the Maroons because they don't want to die and they don't want to be at court. And so they become experts in what is known as guerrilla warfare. Aha. Gorilla being a type of animal. <laughs> <laughs> excellent I, I see where you've gone with that and i embrace it so uh yes they use in their uh, maze the natural maze of sort of the forests and the ravines the cliffs like you were saying the valleys uh, and it gives them basically an excellent place to both hide and live but also to make surprise attacks as well they weren't against actually going out and attacking the british in their plantations and and in their small towns and attack they did they raided and and burned plantations and they struck fear into the hearts of the white enslavers often signaling their attacks by blowing on a large conch seashell it's amazing you brought a conch seashell with you just for that <laughs> i always carry a conch you never know when you need to speak in public i mean you're literally doing that now <laughs> Um, yeah, so a conch, for those people who don't know, or a queen conch, a strombus gigas. Uh, we've talked about on one of our podcasts before. We have, I believe, the Bahamas. Or the Bermuda. Or which the Bermuda. One? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a very, very large sea snail. It has a soft body that retracts into the shell. It generally lives for about 20 to 30 years, and it may survive longer, up to 40 years, some say, if it isn't obviously caught, or indeed eaten by the moon snail, which is its main predator. Which snail versus snail, who knew? Right, and the moon snail climbs up on top of the conch and drills a hole into the shell to reach the soft parts inside. Oh, that's brutal. Nature is nasty. Yeah, it's got like this set of drill teeth and it just drills through that <laughs> shell. It's not a small shell either. No. Anyway, so the Maroons learned of the conch through their interactions with the Kalinago. And so the Maroons learned how to clean the shell, remove the top section of the spire with a hacksaw, smooth it with sandpaper so it doesn't cut their lips, and then blow into it like a trumpet. And they changed the pitch by shaping their lips and their tongue and putting like their hand into the opening of the shell itself. So it acts like, pretty much like a trumpet. There are different sizes and shapes of shell as well, which also create different tones and pitches. And they use these they would blow these to send pre-arranged messages to other tribes and that would pass on information it would sort of let them know that uh, two blasts means people coming or three blasts means victory or whatever it might be right and the sound of the shell also played like this psychological effect on the british so it made like this eerie noise that sort of reverberated through the the forest canopy Ooh, we're coming to get you and you don't know where it's coming from oh, that's creepy. the thing yeah it signals there that, that they're here but you don't know where and so it starts to sort of prey on your mind and a lot of the army would sort of just disband and, and, and run your shit going why are these people so annoyed what have we ever done to them <laughs> that's exactly right uh, would you like to hear some conch playing oh yeah I, i'm ready are you i am all right well then let's do it It's relatively limited, instrumentally speaking. Sounds like a traffic jam. <laughs> there you go. That was interesting. I have to say, not I, I was less musical than I thought. I, yeah, and that, eerie and I couldn't tell where in the studio it was coming from. Anyway, conch shells and the supply of conch shells became so important to the British, it was as much a concern to the authorities as it was on the movement of arms and ammunition. What, because they didn't want people getting hold of conches to organise their raids? Right, organised oh, right. raids, sending messages to each other, like you cut the messaging out. Ah. Yeah. 
Anyway, the last uprising where conch shells were used to pass messages of revolt was the land tax riot in 1893. Although conch messages were still being passed from village to village well into the 20th century, I'm told. Well, if it works. It works, it works, right? I guess it's like Morse code or anything else. Anyway, some of the more notable senior chiefs of the Maroons, like the notorious man called Elephant. Elephant the man. It's an animal though, isn't it? Elephant. It is, it is, yeah. <laughs> I can't help but observe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he You're held... clinging on with your fingertips here, right? <laughs> keep, keep There's adding. more animals coming. He held out for nearly 40 years, which is quite remarkable, but others were not so lucky. Trials of maroon chiefs uh, often concluded in some pretty barbaric medieval-style executions, either being left to rot in an iron gibbet, so just put in an iron cage and left hanging there for a week until you died. There was being hanged and then your head removed and impaled on a spike. Then there's being hanged near to death. Then your insides being removed and burned in front of your eyes and then you being killed. Or if you were sufficiently unlucky enough, you would be broken at the wheel. Oh my lord. Which I was surprised to find was still happening at this point. This is a punishment for those that don't know, which focuses more on torture rather than the death itself. Basically, the victim is, and if you're sensitive to this, I apologize in advance, the victim is tied to the ground, then a large wooden like wagon wheel is lifted and then smashed down sequentially on your leg bones, then on your arm bones, before finally you're then put out of your misery and executed. That's grim. Yes. Horrific end to your life. Despite these consequences, the Maroons continued to resist and fought for over 70 years. In a series of wars which ended with a climactic battle that resulted in, and I quote, the cobblestones running with so much blood that the locals refused to draw water from the public well and it was filled in and covered over. Oh my lord. Isn't that just quite the image for you? Finally, July 31st, 1834, the Emancipation Act comes into effect and at midnight, the ex-slaves take to the streets in celebration. The Maroons could now get work on the plantations under a new rule called the Apprenticeship System. But the plantation owners continue to just treat them as slaves and the Apprenticeship System lasts just two years and ends on August 1st, 1838. When that ends, the slaves take to the streets once more in celebration and they blow conch shells and they dance to the rhythms of their drums. And today, people still celebrate it as carnival. Oh, nice. Something to celebrate eventually. Talking of celebration, should we celebrate? I think we should. In the 17th century, sugar plantation owners in Barbados and Jamaica discovered that byproducts of their molasses refineries could be fermented into... Rum. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. Your favourite. I love it. You do love it. Okay. So rum quickly becomes like the liquor choice in the Caribbean, with distilleries are popping up all over the place throughout the region. And it begins an age where they start to put it in wooden barrels and age these things that make them slightly longer because you're like competing against other distilleries for your for your booze and adding spices for like a richer, you know, more complex flavours, and then you're gonna sell more of it. When rum hits Dominica in the 18th century, the locals start producing their own, okay? I have a bottle here today, Pete, for us to try. Awesome! I've never had a Dominican rum, I don't think. Well, here you are. You're about to have it. That's exciting. Here, have the bottle. It's in its case. It's in a little box, even. In a little box, yeah. Relicario. Relicario. This is nice. This looks good. Rum superior. Dominican rum. Pull out the bottle. Okay. Uh, It's in a lovely square bottle. It's beautiful. Would you like to try some? Very much so. <laughs> okay, here's, your, here's our HHE shot glasses. HHE shot glasses, ready for action. Okay, I'm going to let you uh, pour that. Let me do the honours. Okay. Excellent. Nice shot of Dominican rum. Dominican rum. It's got a lovely amber colour. Ready? Mm-hmm. Ah. Actually, that's not bad. That's nice and smooth. That's pretty nice. That's not got that horrible kick to it where... Um, oh, no, it's kicking in now. My chest, <laughs> my chest is now warm. <laughs> Yeah, that'll, uh, that'll warm the cockles of your heart, my friend. Oh, my goodness. Right. Well, while you're sipping on that, that is just your regular old Dominican rum. Just regular. All right. But there is another type of rum. Oh, yeah. Which... <laughs> <laughs> there you it's go. It's 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 now. <laughs> 
So, taking a lead from the Carib and African knowledge of bush medicine, i.e. using herbs and plants for sort of medicine, curing illnesses, ailments, that sort of thing, the Dominicans started to infuse their rum with different bush medicines, basically as a way of sort of preserving the shelf life. Put it in alcohol, it's going to stay longer. But it's also better than drinking than like hot tea or just rubbing it on your skin or whatever. Known as bush rum, these Dominican rums are infused with flowers, herbs, twigs, plants, just about everything that grows on the island. So mango, maize, guava, passion fruit, pawpaw, uh, carrot, beet, hibiscus, ginger. There's rum with lemongrass in it to help lower cholesterol. There's rum with ginger to help prevent nausea and aid digestion. There's even one secret combination which promises to put the booster in your rooster. Ooh, crumbs. (laughs) It's a natural Viagra. (laughs) <laughs> which is ironic because normally uh drinking a lot of rum would be associated with quite the opposite effect <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah but plants weren't the only thing which went into the rum oh dear <laughs> i feel something dreadful coming up <laughs> let's see where this goes <laughs> they also steeped their booze with animals that's right snakes lizards slugs grasshoppers centipedes worms beetles anything that walked crawled, swam, or flew, these creatures are left in the bottom of a bottle of rum to slowly rot and infuse the liquor with special powers. Okay. All right. Today, you can find bush rum bars across the island. Hundreds of different types of rums are available for you to try and or buy. Have you got any centipede? (laughs) That's exactly (laughs) right. But unfortunately, I'm so sorry to say, you can't export them, right? They are purely for the island inhabitants only. And now I think you're going to go, but I got this slug from the car park so <laughs> uh, i bought some edible insects <laughs> and i used the dominican rum which we've been drinking to infuse our very own he bush, bush rum croydon bush rum that's right this is a niche if ever there so was one. we have three to try all right all right here we go i'm gonna get some that's exciting and i'm going to prepare by drinking more of this rum that he's given me yeah, by way of dutch courage Okay, he's returning with three, like, miniature bottles, as one would uh, get in a hotel bar. Yes. Oh. Right, okay, Okay. so we have... This is, I mean, it looks immediately unappealing from here. That that is crickets. (laughs) Okay, so this is a little bottle with... Crickets. Little tiny, yeah, little crickets in it. Then you've got... They floated to the top, though, which is a bit of a... uh, yeah, <laughs> I thought they would like sink to the bottom, but they did not. They float to the top. <laughs> then you've got mealworms. Mealworms. I mean, they've got meal in them, which implies edibility. Are they're also all... floating to the top. They're maggoty looking things. I'll be honest. They are. That is, that, it looks they like are. it belongs on the shelf of a dubious apothecary or <laughs> carnival sideshow. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got the delightful locust. Locust. That that's, is nasty. That's, that's <laughs> definitely the nastiest one. They're big. That's, they are that's, big. I mean, imagine locusts in rum. <laughs> that's You've got it. There you go. Yeah. You have that image right there. What I'm interested in that one is that the wings dissolved within a day. So the locust wing is now in the juice. So so there's so do we know what powers each of these are going to give us? These are essentially magic potions. I think at we this can point. just make it up at this point. Okay, I don't know. But uh, so the locust rum will give yeah. you the appetite of a thousand locusts. <laughs> okay, so you're going to eat well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. The um, well, this crickets. One, crickets. The crickets Good at cricket. will make you an excellent batsman. Yeah. <laughs> and of yeah. course, the mealworm. Yeah. Will make you hungry. No, they'll make you able to burrow through the ground. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 that's how that works. That's an amazing one. Right. So, how so we, we need to pull these out, though. We can't drink them from the bottle because that's just consuming the straight insect, isn't it? Yeah, well, we've got glasses, so... Do we need, we oh, need you more... want to strain them? Because they're no. edible, you can have them with it. I guess, but they're going to just pour... I know what I'll do. All right, here we go. So, um, Ryan, possibly a, a foolish question. Will yes. he be joining me in these beverages? I'd love to, <laughs> but I have a podcast to, to I do. So I'm going to drink and pod. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you while you're drinking them. Okay, that's, that's what I good. thought. So we've got a little thing. I thought I could tell you about this. some of the animals of... Um, oh, oh, it's going everywhere. It's not gone everywhere. Yeah. Shall I get a tissue, though? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have started with the... Let's have a look. Oh, you've gone heavy, straight into the locust. Straight into the locust, because it will give me the appetite, you see. (laughs) It's the powers that I'm interested in, right? That's amazing. You just love powers, don't you? I do. I feel like this is my superhero origin story. Mm -hmm. You might be my nemesis supervillain. Right, here we go. This is the locust one. 
<laughs> it's nice. It's nice. Um, taste any it different? It doesn't taste wildly different, if I'm being honest. So let's try crickets. <laughs> oh, he's, he's actually going to take the whole lot. Did you, you just had one, didn't you? I didn't eat. No, I didn't do the crickets. Did you not? I'm okay. going to do a cricket. Oh, yeah. Oh. Did you chew it? Or just swallow it in one? Chewed it. Why would you chew it? I don't know. He said it was an edible cricket. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a problem? <laughs> Did it come with instructions of some kind? Have I done it wrong? No, I just didn't know why you chewed just it. Taste, it just tasted like a kind of bit of wheat or something. It's just. Mm, I think I'd go for a cricket over a locust. I'm going to work up to that. I'm, my ambition is to try all these things and give them, do them justice. All right. It's just a food. It's Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Dominica, it's home to 188 species of birds, 11 species of stick insect, 55 species of butterfly, 17 species of reptile, 4 amphibian, 10 species of bats, 320 species of reef fish. It's got boa constrictors, it's got broad-winged hawks, it's got opossums, and Amazona imperialis, or Cicero parrot. Oh, a parrot. Oh, hence the flag, of course. Hence the flag, the national animal. That's right. Found only in Dominica. This is a parrot which has lived on the island for several hundred thousand years. Wow. Right? It's so beloved and its likeness is is used. I have a um, question about the parrot, mm. if I may. Yeah. When you say it has a parrot on the flag. Yeah. How does that, is it just like an out, a silhouetted parrot or is it like no. a little parrot face? Is it the whole parrot? It's the whole parrot. The whole parrot. The and whole is it like, parrot. what's the kind of, how, what detail do you get? On a on a flag? Yeah. Well, I mean, a parrot is principally two colours. <laughs> so it's just the, the shape of it, the outline of the, the parrot and right. then the, the colours inside. Okay, well, you have to visit hhepodcast.com and have a see the picture of the parrot. That's right, picture of the parrot. Yes, so it is so beloved that its likeness is on the national coat of arms and on the national flag. It is a big bird. It grows up to about 48 centimetres. Oh, that's pretty pretty large. Ruler and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that sitting on your shoulder though, right? Sitting on your shoulder. <laughs> this is your Pirates of the Caribbean yes. coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Notably, their chest is a dark shade of purple, hence the purple on the flag. Its upper parts and its wings are both this bright green. They live in mountain areas, usually about 2,000 feet uh, above sea level, 625 metres. They are super shy and difficult to approach, uh, and they travel in groups of three or fewer. Oh, wow. They're like... Uh... I don't know, hikers or something. <laughs> <laughs> Flyers. Yeah. They can live for up to 70 years. Wow. Isn't they're that cool? Remarkable creatures, parrots, aren't they? Do they speak? Are they talking parrots? Uh, yeah, they're talking parrots. Yeah, for sure. You could teach one to, to talk. For so sure. why, why are they so beloved? Is it just that their plumage is so nice? Yes, I think it's because their plumage is so beautiful. They just stand out. You just imagine them flapping around. Beautiful things. Uh, they mate for life. They're extremely faithful to each other, usually grieving to death oh, rather man. than finding a new mate. I'm going to start adopting now. So I love you as much as a parrot would. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, are you going for the, the other one yet? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Now, this, this one, worm. a mealworm has escaped into it, I'll be honest, and it doesn't appeal to me at, at all. Of the, all of the things, I'd rather crunch really? the locust than no. the, the maggoty thing. Here we go. Oh, he really has done it as well. That was a lot. I don't know if it's just knowing that it was a maggoty looking thing. That was not so good. <laughs> I've never seen you act like that before. <laughs> that was amazing. That went against all my instincts. <laughs> you did so well, though, man. You've sampled everything except the locust now. Well, I don't mind them doing that. I'll do it. They are big, though. Mm-hmm. They're like the size of a wasp. For sure. I might have to work my way up to that. You've got a big head as well. There's like, a, yeah, just... I mean, you can see its face. You really can. That's a whole <laughs> different ball game. <laughs> Were they soggy, like soft, when you ate the mealworm? Or did you didn't chew that one? The mealworm I just put straight down because that okay. was too grubby for my taste. So. <laughs> it really okay, I'm going to do a locust. Uh, when I'm going to work up to a locust. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll finish this bit. I'll dispense perhaps. a locust and see how I it. feel. Oh, man, that is... Okay. Okay. Uh, Cicero Parrot, we're still on that. <laughs> <laughs> so a pair will nest only every other year. So every two years. And they normally fledge one chick from a clutch of two eggs. So that's not many, right? Which is might explain why the Cicero is an extremely serious endangered. <laughs> yeah, it's a big commitment, yeah. Uh, but it is extremely endangered. Uh, there's a population currently of just about 250 to 350 individuals, which is better than 2019. Remember the, the big hurricane? Uh, only 50 individuals were alive after the hurricane. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Poor things must have just been absolutely what blasted. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, habitat loss is another cause. Obviously, humans uh, logging and deforestation, that sort of stuff. We do um, do that to almost everyone, everywhere, as far as I can see, animal wise. We do, and sadly, of course, some are sold on the black market and put in a cage. 
No, it's really awful. But they are beautiful. I regret buying one now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, reptiles. Uh, the iguana, largest reptile found in Dominica. I like an iguana. Yeah. Uh, sea turtles, you can find them commonly. I'm a massive fan of a sea turtle. Imagine that, a sea turtle pulling up on a black sand beach. They've got a sort of lazy elegance to them. Something you can associate with. Ah, laziness and elegance. <laughs> yeah. Several species of snake. Uh, we mentioned the boa constrictor. Boa constrictor, by the way, locally is known as techen, which is dog head. Dog head? Yeah. That's a curious name. Techen. I've been more focusing on the, uh, it's squeezing me to death, than, oh, it looks like a dog. I think it's because it's the size of a dog's head. <laughs> like the head of it looks like a dog's head. Uh, yeah, anyway, been. maybe. But of course, the island also includes the waters around it. And there is so much life in the water around the Dominica. The water in the coast around Dominica is warm. The currents are few and visibility is routinely 50 plus feet, which is really far. Wow. Makes it one of the best places in the world for free diving. Are the coral reefs around there, full of marine life. 320 species of reef fish, as we mentioned. Uh, and a worthy mention for Champagne Reef. It's so named because bubbles of volcanic gases spring from these like teeny tiny vents at the bottom on the on the ocean floor oh, it's and, a busy it, reef. and it looks like sparkling water <laughs> and it really does it's amazing there you're going to see crabs eels trunk fish eels eels i love eels yeah <laughs> <laughs> sponges urchins soap fish porcupine fish fireworms fireworms honestly you're making some of these up sure i am actually no, no these are all real <laughs> and a hundred unidentifiable others they say wow. yeah there's marlin sailfish tarpon wahoo dorado mackerel and yellowfin skipjack at least two of those sounded like snacks what the wahoo and dorado yes <laughs> <laughs> and then and, and of course let's not forget the largest of the animals in dominica the sperm whales there is a resident pod of sperm whales in dominica's waters which reside there 365 days of the year it's the only place in the world where it happens awesome just, just hang so out there just like we're the dominican sperm whales sperm whales dad i need to tell you something what is it son i've decided to go traveling traveling yeah, I want to see the world. But why? You've got everything here. There's a lovely, deep, warm, fizzy water. All the squid you can eat. And the relaxing tones of the conch. But I want to visit other waters, Dad. Colder waters. Murkier waters. This is a gilded cage and I'm locked up. I want to feel foreign air on my blowhole. But it's not what we do, son. Dominican whales stay in Dominica. It was good enough for your grandfather and his grandfather before him. It's our tradition. But Dad, I need to find myself. What kind of whale am I? You're a sperm whale, son. Sperm. Sperm, 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 sperm. Lovely sperm. Wonderful sperm. But I don't like sperm. Right, that's enough of that. This podcast is silly. All right, go on then, down the locust. No, I'm going to eat the locust. Are you going to pull it out? I'm going to, yeah, I think so. I'm going to put that one back in the bowl. Yeah. And then I'm going to eat the locust and then I'm going to down the rum. I'm edgy because it's, it's as we dis really as discussed, big. has it does have a face. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Oh, he's chewing it. Okay. That well was done. That was all right. It didn't really taste of anything. It just tasted as if someone had left a scrap of paper, really, or something. In uh, the, it was just sort of, crunchy. It wasn't crunchy because it's mm, obviously so some true. stuff. Obviously, I now have the power of a thousand locusts and the ability to... resistance of a grub. No, you can <laughs> dig through the ground. And apparently. I can, on my way back, I'll tunnel. I'll tunnel <laughs> home. That's what I'll do. <laughs> right. Back to our time. Yes. The, the maroons, they're facing this perpetual battle, right, as they're moving around. They can't sort of grow food as much because they're in places that aren't easy to sort of grow their own food. So food is pretty much all coming from foraging. This is an increasing problem as the plantations are cutting back the forest. So a typical meal. You're a maroon, what are you going to eat? You're going to start the day with salt fish, dried and salted codfish. More substantial meals, we're looking at something called chateau water, which... That sounds great. It sounds like bottled spring water. Yeah, like chateaued how, water. Mm. Do you want the chateau water? Yes, I do. Still or sparkling? <laughs> okay, well, it's actually octopus soup. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's inspired by a French cuisine. Uh, it's a one-pot dish which had chopped octopus, dumplings, and assorted vegetables in it. 
There aren't many mammal species on the island that's, you know, like worth eating, but the Maroons did go out of their way to hunt one in particular, the agouti. So they would cook this in a stew with a spicy sauce and serve it with various vegetables like dasheen, which is like green, thick green leaves, and yam. Uh, but what is the agouti, I hear you ask? I mean, I literally was about to ask that. I could have saved you that little bit of... Uh, you didn't need input. to. I knew it was coming. Well, it's a cross between a guinea pig and a squirrel. A squinny pig? Uh, yeah, it's uh, brought to the island by the Kalinago centuries before. It's about the size of a medium-sized cat. I love that you're sorting your cats by size. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it makes an attractive proposition for meat, because if you can get a creature like that, then that's it. more people can eat per, per creature. But it can be hard to catch. Uh, they are shy. They move quietly on their tippy toes, one of the few rodents that do that, and they can be easily missed. Plus, they live on the sides of mountains, in covered areas, on steep slopes and along streams. So very difficult sort of creature to catch, but if you get one, it's a good meal. Also, they're easily frightened, Pete. Their defence tactic is to jump six feet in the air. Wow. Yeah, that's one and a half metres, slightly more, in the air, spin around, land, and dash off in the opposite direction. I Desperately want to see that. <laughs> Imagine you're like walking through the woods and then suddenly Something this thing leaps up. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. They have dark brown fur, which is covered in like this oily residue and smelly apparently, which waterproofs them from the rain. They have five toes on their front feet, three toes on their rear feet. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> no, that, um, I, that's interesting. What I was trying to hold back from was saying... Why? Why has that happened? How has evolution made that a thing? But I didn't expect you to know the answer, so I was trying to be quiet. Yeah. You'd think five on the back feet so they could run faster or something. Propel a rear-wheel drive kind of thing. Five toes on the front feet means they can grab more things like seeds Ah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, who knows? Yeah, they have layers of enamel on their teeth, which is twisted in such a way that it makes them incredibly strong teeth, basically strong enough to crack a Brazil nut. In fact, it's the only animal that can do that. Wow, right? the Brazil nut's natural enemy has been discovered. <laughs> yeah, they love to eat fruit and they have ears so sensitive that they can hear when fruit hits the ground. Now come running across through the forest to get it. If an apple falls in the forest, there Doesn't isn't a... Doesn't a... hear it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They sit upright to eat, hold food like with their front feet like a squirrel. That sounds super cute. Yeah. And uh, like a squirrel, they also bury food around the territory for like future meals and stuff. Also, like the Cicero parrot, they bond for life and they have up to four babies, which are born just three months after conception. And uh, those babies can run after just an hour after birth. If I ever have children, I plan to make them start jogging within within the first 24 hours, certainly. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So uh, unfortunately, we don't know how many agouti there are. Not enough research has been done. As you described. (laughs) And they're well hidden. But they are are still hunted and still yeah there are regulated governmental hunting seasons for the agouti so if you go there you might be able to try some i couldn't find any unfortunately and i wasn't willing to kill a squirrel <laughs> for you so <laughs> okay. that remains i've unknown. murdered in the neighborhood <laughs> to make you eat or drink <laughs> mashed together to create a guinea pig and a squirrel <laughs> And they said I was mad. (laughs) Anyway, right. (laughs) Have another rum, please, Pete. All right, I'm pouring it. Bring it. He's gone for regular rum as well. I wasn't expecting that, but that's good. Oh, I just assumed you didn't want something that was full of insects. Of course I don't want it. That's for you. (laughs) And I am going to drink it. I know you are. Thank you. Let me tell you about the animal that was plentiful in this wet and rocky rainforest of Dominica. Do you want to know about it? I do. What do you reckon it is? An animal that was plentiful? Yeah, for them to eat. Um, the clue was wet and rocky an rainforest. Iguana. Well, that's interesting. It is not iguana. It is the mountain chicken. Oh, look, if it had you said they were running, there's chickens running around, I would have obviously picked that. <laughs> <laughs> but there weren't chickens running around. The mountain chicken. That's right. Is it an iguana? It's not, No. It's a frog. Oh. It's called the crapo. Crapo is a French word meaning toad. Uh, and it comes from the Frankish word crapo, which means hook, which I think is a reference to the toad's hooked feet. Crapo was a delicious meal and the French enjoyed it very much. And it became sort of like this derogatory, offensive slang name for a French person during this time period. The name Johnny Crapo was used by British sailors uh, during the Napoleonic War to refer to their French enemy. 
Anyway, the crapo on Dominica is one of the largest frogs in the world, one of only the four amphibians found on the island. Uh, they also live at high elevations, another reason why the maroons were eating them. Easy to catch, they formed a stable food source, also a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin A and potassium. So you're getting a lot of good stuff in you by eating a frog. I can only imagine the Arawaks going, ah, this is also a good source of uh, omega-3. <laughs> <laughs> Not, I'm hungry and this is a frog, would you like to eat it? I would. <laughs> That's pretty much what they did. Uh, depending on who was being served, so whether you're the chief or whether you're like some kid, you're either going to get the legs, which is the best bit, or the body. The meat is described by nearly everyone as tasting exactly like chicken, hence the name Mountain Chicken. Fun fact! Mountain chicken became so ubiquitous with Dominican cuisine over the centuries that it was recognised as the national dish. Wow. Right? And even placed as one of the national symbols on Dominica's coat of arms. This feels like a, a tourist era ripe for happening where you go and you go, ooh, I'll have the mountain chicken mm. expecting a chicken. You would not get a chicken. And that would be hilarious. Yeah, it would, yeah. But within the past decade, the crapo has succumbed to a fungal infection of epidemic proportions. And combined with the destruction of natural habitat and also the hurricane, there are now very few left in the wild and it's nearing extinction, sadly. Most Dominicans say that it's been several years since they've heard the distinctive mating call. We should stop eating them immediately, would be my advice. Yeah, so as of 2013, the new national dish is a callaloo soup made from dasheen, vegetables and meat. Anyway, in Dominica between 1764 and 1848, there are plenty of crapo, and frog's legs are being eaten in huge numbers by maroons. So I thought we would be doing a disservice to Dominican history if we didn't partake in the same froggy treat. I agree 100%. As such, I contacted the ever-incredible Naomi, our HHE food consultant, oh, really? who we've asked for help before on some of our episodes where we've cooked sort of period food, and she gave me the most amazing sort of instructions and guidance on how to prepare you some as close to authentic mountain chicken as possible. So, Pete, wait there a second. So while you're eating these, I'm going to tell you how I prepared them. Um, what, do you want to describe what you've got on your plate there? So I have three... Three legs. Limbs. Yeah. <laughs> I would describe them as. Which is weird. I don't know why they sent me just three. That was a weird frog that had three legs. <laughs> that, that, that I'd be worried about. Let me tell you about it. Right, so at this time in Dominica, frog's legs are likely prepared with a combination of French and Carib African techniques. Okay, this is from Naomi's notes. And with French influence being so strong in Dominica at this time, Naomi looked to the French cook, the first French cookbook written by François Pierre de la Varine in 1653. It describes thus. Choose the finest and the biggest. Dress them cherry-like, that is to say, scrape the thighs of your frogs so that the bone be clean at one end. Whiten them a very little and dry them. Make a paste with flour, salt, milk, white cheese of each a very little. Stamp all in a mortar and make it liquid until it be like a paste for fritters. Take your frogs by the bone end, dip them in and put them in very hot butter. Fry them as fritters and serve garnished with fried parsley. So pretty descriptive instructions there on how to make frog's legs. Now, Naomi's suspicion was that not much was going to change between the time these recipes were written and when maroons were preparing crapo. But because of the Afro-Carib influence, Naomi took inspiration from a recipe she found in 1973, Elizabeth Lambert Ortez's cookbook, Complete Book of Caribbean Cooking. And then she considered what ingredients were available at the time and created the recipe for me to follow. So this is what I did. I had to wash and skin the frog's legs in salt water because water was a precious commodity at the time. Cane production dominated the agriculture, so focus was on sort of conserving and channeling water for cane production, which meant that there was not a lot of fresh water to be devoted to sort of cleaning or cooking the frog, so salt water would have had to be been best, right, because it's surrounded by the ocean. Side note, Naomi wrote in her notes, have fun with that, meaning the skinning and washing of the frog's eggs, and she was not wrong. Frankly, it took me hours... <laughs> <laughs> and I genuinely hated every second of it. Oh, okay, it was, good. As long as you're suffering too. This frankly, is... the worst thing I've ever done. <laughs> oh, Pulling really? the skin from these legs was awful. 
Wow, and we've done some pretty bad things on this podcast. It, it went on so long. Anyway, next I marinated the legs in thyme, garlic, and hot pepper. And because limes weren't introduced as a major crop into Dominica until the mid-1850s, rice vinegar, Naomi suggested, would replicate corn chicha, which is a type of liquor that they had available at the time, and that they would have used that. Anyway... After letting the legs marinate, I then coated them with flour, let them sit for 10 minutes, and then shallow fried them in coconut oil. They fried them for a couple of minutes on each side, I let them drain, and et voila! Et le voilà crapaud! Indeed, le crapaud. These look amazing, actually. I'm going to munch into them. Here we go. That's very tasty. Well, the question is, does mountain chicken taste like chicken? I would say... Only to the extent that all white meat tastes like chicken. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said that's chicken. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Unless it actually is chicken. That is actually chicken. Oh, damn it. Yeah, and which sounds like I cheated, but hear me out. So you can't actually buy crapo, right? Obviously, it's an endangered species. Yeah. And <laughs> I wasn't going to start importing <laughs> endangered species for you to eat. But you can buy frog's legs on the market, right? It's a commercial thing. There are plenty of companies that will sell them. In fact, 4,000 tons of frog's legs are sold in France every year, which sounds huge, but that is a small number compared to what's eaten in Asia, South America, and even in the United States every year. And what I've discovered is, is that the human consumption of frogs is pushing the world's population towards extinction just our human consumption of it. UN trade data suggests we may be consuming as, as many as 1 billion frogs every year. That makes amphibians the most threatened animal group after mammals and birds. Basically, one third of all amphibian species are now listed as threatened. Pollution, pesticides, other man-made ills, frogs basically just disappearing. The French Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries actually put regulations in place to ban all hunting of frogs in France uh, in 1976. Uh, in 1980, they then banned commercial frog harvesting as well. So there's no frog farming then? Not in France at all. It's all imports. Everything is imported into France. So where are they importing these frogs from? Indonesia is the world's largest exporter of frogs by far. They ship more than 15,000 tons each year. The key to that, though, is that only some of these are sustainably farmed, but not many. The vast majority of frogs that end up on plates around the world are harvested directly from the wild. These are rural families which are trying to basically supplement their income by catching and selling wild frogs. There's no data, there's no tracking, there's no stock management, and there's no quality control. So, you know, on this occasion, the mountain chicken you're eating is, in fact, chicken. I've been duped. Chicken wings. I'm delighted to have been duped. The texture feels a little bit different. I don't know if I'm just used to deep fried chicken. <laughs> How's the marinade? Can you mm, taste the garlic yeah. and the thyme and the pepper? It's a, it's relatively mild, right? Because we're used to very vibrant chicken batters, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, so it's relatively mild, but it's very tasty. Yeah, no, I just want to say a huge thank you to Naomi for her help. It was uh, incredible, the effort that she went into and very quickly was able to, to let me know how you cook frog's legs from 1764 to 1848 in Dominica. Okay. Right, Henderson, where are we with marketing and PR? Well, as you know, you asked us to consider the problem of humans killing so many chickens. Yes, I did. Well, focus groups showed that while they do kill an awful lot of chickens, humans don't actually hate chickens at all. They just love the taste of chicken. Interesting. Continue. So, we've been working on an idea to convince the humans that another animal tastes like chicken. And? We piloted Mountain Chicken. Which is? It's a frog song. A frog? Yeah, the crapo of Dominica. We got thousands of humans to eat frog and say it tasted like chicken. So, a success? Yes and no. The problem is that now the frogs are endangered. Oh dear. So we workshopped it and we narrowed in on a solution. Which is? Convince the humans that everything tastes like chicken. Interesting. Go on. Well, there's field chicken, that's another type of frog, sir. Then there's sea chicken, which is actually a fish. Uh, we're working on desert chicken, sky chicken, jungle chicken, and believe it or not, there's a fungus that literally grows on trees, and that we're trying to rebrand as chicken of the woods. Oh, look, this all seems very complicated. Can't we just tell the humans that killing animals for food is wrong? I mean, what's wrong with a handful of delicious grain scattered across the yard? Well, actually, sir, some 
some of them don't eat animals. Those ones call themselves vegans. Ah, so why don't we just go and talk to these vegans and get them to go on and on and on and on and on about how healthy it is and how good it is for the body and the environment. Then other humans will just follow them and do the same. That's a long shot, sir, but it might just work. Well, keep me abreast. And that's it, Peter. That is Animal in Dominica during 1764 to 1848. So, Ryan, I was expecting lots of animal facts. I was not expecting to eat most of the animals <laughs> that <laughs> came along. I thought that was very interesting. You had a challenging situation in the Dominica, very tiny place, mm. a limited time period. And I think you did uh, wonderful work. I was very lucky with the time period. There was an awful lot that happens. And there's so much there that I will be telling you about during the verdict because I just couldn't fit it into this episode. But uh, yeah, it's it's an incredible time where a lot was happening on that very small island. Well, I think you did magnificently and I thoroughly enjoyed it, even though you tried to make me eat all sorts of unusual things. But mm. I remain unbowed. I've enjoyed much. I couldn't really do the grub thing, but the crickets and Locust. uh, locusts, they were okay. Well done. You have my full admiration. Well man. done you. You did all the work. All I did was drink rum and eat insects. <laughs> should we hit the does, later? I think we should. It's your turn this time. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, turning it on. Okay, and your country is... Latvia. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an island in the South Pacific. That is true, actually. No, actually, I'm reasonably comfortable with Latvia. I haven't been to Latvia even. Oh, very good. Okay, and your time period is... 2005 to 2010. I'm going to breathe an enormous sigh of relief with that. <laughs> okay, it's all about topic. It is. You ready? And your topic is... Hell or high water? Oh, that's interesting. And I feel confident and excited to bring you something amazing that's going to blow your mind. Hell or high water in Latvia during 2005 to 2010. It's only five years, Pete. It's only five years, but it's five recent and well-documented years, which makes all the difference in my experience. <laughs> Hell or high water? Well, we'll find out, I guess. I'm looking forward to it. That's going to uh, be a good too, one. man. Okay, Ryan, I have to say I really enjoyed that. It was a great episode and it was fascinating and Delicious. fulfilling. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, audience, thank you very much for listening. That's our show for this week. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things we've talked about on the show or just to say hello, you can reach out to us through the website, hhepodcast.com or email Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. Uh, one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Your recommendations can really help us bring the show to new listeners. That's right. And if you're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, you can find us at HHE podcast. And if you subscribe to those, you're going to get an alert every time we post one of our one minute animated HHE bites. That would have given you a little head start on the Arawaks for starters. We've it definitely would. encountered them a few times on our animations. But we will be back again soon with the verdict. But until then, huge thanks to you, Ryan. Thank you, Peter. And I guess that's it. All that's left to say is you've been listening to. History. Happened everywhere. A Kentucky Fried Frog. We'd like you to know your rights. You've got a right. The only frog cooked fresh with the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices. Original recipe. Frog. You've got a right to crisp. Frog. Made fresh right here. And you've got a right to hot buttermilk. Frog. Every batch made from scratch. You've got a right. Frog. Right. Frog. Frog. So there we have it, sir. What do you think? I love it. Great work, Henderson. Seamless stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a chicken.